Center for Light and Space. My name's Nola. I manage the facility here for training and education. Um, we're one of four facilities in the U.S., just to kind of give you a little background. Our other facilities are in Conyers, New York, and Ohio, Granville, Ohio. And um, we do lots of different courses here. Like next week, we'll have visual training for exterior. We have healthcare training, healthcare lighting training, um, some outdoor lighting training also coming up um, in August. So if you ever have any questions about the training and education facilities here and need extra CEU credits, just let me know. I, I'll be around tonight. Um, to, today, this is uh, Thursday nights, martinis and lights. And this is our second time to host it in Berkeley, so thank you for joining us today. And today's talk is by Kevin Leffer, and it is, it is worth <coughs> one AIA credit. And I do have certificates for those of y'all who do need it. I'll give it out to y'all at the end of the talk or when y'all are leaving. Just come and find me. Um, so, I believe everybody has a drink <laughs> of some sort. So if you want to raise your glasses, Let's raise a toast to Thursday's nights because it's time for martinis and lights. Cheers. 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 Let me introduce Kevin for you. Kevin Cheers. has a background in architectural engineering. He has two decades of luminaire design experience covering commercial, industrial, and residential applications. He has over 22 patents. He um, is most well known for um, Acuity Brand's visual lighting design software. And he now leads the one-of-a-kind Luminaire Concept Center in Colorado, where his team is responsible for developing novel lighting products for commercialization by the other Acuity Brands, various brands. So, welcome, Kevin. Thank you, Nola. <laughs> wow, so good turnout tonight. Thanks for coming out. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, great. Well, it, let me start off by saying that in this presentation, uh, Peter and I and Janine Wang uh, contributed particularly on the OLED materials, so thanks to them for their help and, and guidance in that part. So, solid state lighting, not just another light source. Solid state lighting is currently in its infancy, you know, and, and, and I, I think the entire industry is gripped with anticipation, wondering where these wonderful new technologies are going to take us. Uh, and if there's really one central message that you can take away from here tonight, I hope it'll be this, that we're being presented with an opportunity to redefine the purpose of lighting. That is, what it is and how we use it. Well, what do I mean by that? This is... Uh, a couple of lists here that I put together for LED and for OLED. I'm calling them enabling attributes, but this is just off the top of my head. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list by any stretch. Just off the top of my head, I listed the various attributes of these sources that are superior to incumbent technologies. It is in these ways that these two sources are superior to the incumbent technologies. I'm not going to go through this list item by item, relax. <laughs> uh, no, really the point is the size of the list. Okay, because, you know, traditionally one or two items is, is, is enough to warrant the development of a new product. When you've got a list that looks like this, you really have to stand back and say, gee, it, it, it's just not possible that tomorrow looks like yesterday. Thing, things have to change in a big way. I'm not sure what that means, but they have to change in a very fundamental way when you're looking at a list like that. Everybody agree? So, you might be wondering, well, I've heard all the hype about these technologies and how it's going to change everything, and yet maybe I'm not seeing that so much yet. Kind of wondering why. Well, let me see if I can maybe shed some light on that for you. So what's been happening up until now? Focuses on light source suitability. Of course, it has to prove itself worthy. It's all about lumens, color, consistency, light source attributes. Because the light source has to reach a point to, to where it's actually viable. So that's why the focus on that early on. So it's, it, it's those typical uh, issues that we look at for light sources. Most of that early activity was driven by SSL providers. 
and a lot of attention early on in replacement lamps for obvious reasons. So what's going on presently? Well, there's an unprecedented amount of product development going on industry-wide. No matter where you look, people are just scurrying like crazy. Uh, <clears throat> why? Well, th think about Acuity Brands Lighting and how many products we have. There's literally tens of thousands of unique products. They were developed over decades with a small resource. And we've got a small resource for product development today. Suddenly, and seemingly overnight, we've got to go in and replace all of those existing products with LED equivalents. Why? Because there's immediate market demand. The market is asking for it. We really don't have an option but to do that. And the same is true for all the other manufacturers. And it's not, it's not so much a uh, intense, uh, it's not intense in the area of breakthroughs and so on, so much as just getting the technology to work in, in, in the paradigm that, that we're accustomed to. Now, because of that, some of these products have been described as vacuum tube mimicry. Uh, Mark Lean from Hubble used that term, and, 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 and I think it's an interesting term. It sounds a little bit degrading, and I do, certainly don't mean it that way. As I said, there's no time. We've got to develop these products, and we've got to do it quickly, or we lose. So if you were in Conyers at corporate ABL, you would see people going like crazy trying to do this. And, and you've seen those products coming out one at a time, as fast as we can move, right? But the term vacuum tube mimicry, it really is. We're, we're, we're trying to make yesterday's thing, today's thing, right, with LEDs. And same thing's happening everywhere. So what's going to happen looking forward then? Well. Energy conservation is going to drive intelligence. You'd have to be hiding under a rock somewhere to not know that at this point. Okay. Uh, but I think another piece that's really interesting is systems. Everything is getting more complicated. And anybody who's ever tried to commission a, a, a job with you know, sophisticated controls knows that it can get really ugly in a hurry. We're going to take it now in order of magnitude greater in terms of complexity. Ouch. This tells me that the future is one of systems. We, we need to start working, working less. Here's, here's that light and this light, and then I'm going to take my control and plug it in. And more an integrated system out of the hole so that it's just a plug and play, no hassles. I think things are going to start shifting in that direction. Application specificity. In the old days, you had high bays. You want to light up a big space, you use high bays. That's it. It's a generic product. Well, you start breaking those applications down and saying, what, what are people really doing in there? You find a lot of opportunity to save energy, do a better job of lighting by making products more specific to the application. So I think we're going to slowly start seeing products that are for big box retail, say, instead of just being a generic high bay. Uh, and then the last one there, re rethinking what is taken for granted. I think this is the biggest thing of all. Everything that we've been taught about lighting, including the very concept of a point source and how photometry works and every bit of it, was all based on old light source technology and how it behaves. It was good enough to do what we needed to do there. It's not good enough anymore. Now we've got to expand these things. The same thing's true from a, a standpoint of application. If you don't really, really know the applications, you're going to have a hard time going to the next level. Uh, I think it takes a certain boldness, courage, to go back and question these things that we've taken for granted ever since we entered the business. Uh, even something as fundamental as the lumen, it's going to be re redone, right? We've, we've got to start over because now that's not enough. <clears throat> so the technology revolution will enable spectral attenuation. I assume most of you have, 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 have at, least, at least heard some buzz about that. Uh, it's changing the color spectrum over time. Uh, daylight simulation is one example. We'll probably see some products that are doing that. 
health and well-being, a lot of activity going on in that area. You've heard all about the blue light and the pupil lumens and so on and so forth. There's more information coming out all the time. I think it's still a little bit early to draw conclusions and you gotta be careful because the first rule is do no harm, right? So we wanna get some more information before we're really prepared to take a firm position on it. But the one thing that is clear, it is gonna happen. The information's coming out, uh, it's being repeated, and soon there will be recommendations and we will, we will take this into account in lighting design. Uh, integration, uh, we're gonna see that at the component level, at the architecture and infrastructure level. Uh, if, if, if the light source lasts 100,000 hours, you can build it right into the architecture side. If it's the size of a grain of salt, it's easy to tuck it away in small places. So I think these are reasons that we're gonna see it become more integrated. Uh, and then companion technologies as well. Bring all that into the same package rather than the bolt-on uh, uh, paradigm that we're accustomed to. I think we're gonna see that stuff integrated right out of the hole just for simplicity's sake. And then lastly, and extremely important, new fa form factors and style. And be careful not to uh, underestimate this one because this is probably the thing that'll kick it off. We all get tired of the same old thing. We all want something new. I think that's gonna be the thing that really enables it ultimately. <coughs> so now, We've, we've got to the point that the light source is truly viable, but we've been speaking in crude terms, lumens and watts and just real basic metrics. Now it's time to bring lighting quality back into the picture. And this is a list of the things that I think of when I think of lighting quality. I, I, as a luminaire designer, these are the things that I do or attempt to do. Don't so much make light as package it for utilization and for purpose. That's what we do. And uh, let me use this platform to complain that I see descriptions of lighting quality that include things like uh, maintenance schedules. Th that's diffusing the picture that is already too diffuse. Lighting quality is lighting quality. That, I'm not saying it's not an important consideration in the whole picture, but economics is not part of lighting quality. Lighting quality is exclusive to the quality of lighting. I think it's important that we do a better job with those things because if we're gonna get to the point where we can truly articulate those things and act on them, we have to be clear in our definitions and terminology. Why? Because lighting's for people. It's not just math and physics and chemistry and so on. It's about architecture, ergonomics, psychology, emotion. Lighting touches us. And I think we're getting ready to find out in, 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 in ways that we didn't even appreciate. Now, on that note, I, I, I wanna point something out for the benefit of those who, who, who may not already know this. I've had some people ask me, is OLED gonna overtake LED? And I stop and I think, what a silly question. But I, then I realize that a lot of people don't design luminaires for a living and so they may not know uh, inherently what the difference is. So let me point it out, just in, uh, for the benefit of anybody who does not. LED and OLED are complementary technologies. LED is a point source. Tiny, tiny thing. Again, the size of a grain of salt. What that does is it allows optical control. I can place the light very precisely with optics because it's a point source. I'll show you why in a second if you're not familiar. But because it's a tiny little source, if, if we've got X number of lumens in case A and X number of lumens in case B, this one's tiny and this one's not, the tiny one has to be more luminous. In order to produce the same number of lumens, it has to be proportionately more luminous uh, in a comparison of surface area. So because it gets so luminous, it requires shielding now. You've gotta get something in the way and, and, and be careful from a glare standpoint. It also produces sharp shadows, and I'll, I'll make that clearer here in a moment as well. And point sources are also what we typically associate with sparkle. Area sources won't give you sparkle. 
OLED, on the other hand, is one to two millimeter thick plane that emits light all over its surface. Because it's spreading that brightness over a larger area, it's not as bright. So it's easy on the eyes, visually comfortable. Because it's large, it produces soft shadows. Again, I've got a diagram here in a minute that'll, that'll help uh, explain that. And then I miss the unforgiving and forgiving here. Let me, let me just chat about that for a minute. In the case of a point source, if you develop optics around that point source, the optics are trained on that thing being exactly where it's supposed to be. You move it a little bit, manufacturing variations, all bets are off. Who knows what you get? But when you've got a large area source, scooch it a little bit, no effect really. Okay, so th these, these are other things that separate the two. So now let me talk a little bit about this business of, sh of, of shadows. So if we had a source up there, and then we introduce an occlusion there in the middle right here, what happens is it'll produce some pattern on, onto the ground down here. And these, these two regions are known as the, as the umbra and the penumbra. The umbra in the center there is the region where you can't see that source at all. It's completely occluded. The penumbra is where it's partially occluded. And then when you get out here, it's not occluded at all. And you can determine those angles and so on by drawing these bounding lines and it shows you exactly how that works based on the size of the source. Can everybody see then if the source collapses to a point, that penumbra collapses to nothing? In other words, you get a sharp shadow. But as the source gets larger, it's softer at the edges. Okay. Now, in a somewhat analogous way, let's talk about this optical control piece. So imagine I've got a big source. And then I got, when you talk about optics, you need to talk about a point of regard because you're always going to look at it with respect to what? So we're going to look at this, this particular situation with respect to the point labeled A. And it's really a point even though there's a line there. I just put the line so you can get the pitch of the surface. But I'm really just talking about one tiny little point there, okay? Now if I color that source, so that one side is green and one side is red, and you can see the nature of the light path and how it reflects from point A. The green arrow shows you the normal of point A, or the, or the direction that surface faces. And so it follows Snell's law and, and, and reflects on the opposite side into a zone that is equal to the size of the zone that it came in from. Does everybody follow that okay? No, who said no? <laughs> okay, so you see the arrows that are dictating the zone on the top. It's an angular zone, okay? It comes into point A, so the part that comes in from the red edge gets reflected at a different angle than the part that comes in from the green edge. And everything from that source between the boundaries gets reflected into a zone of the same size. So if I have a large source in close proximity to the optic, I don't have optical control. You get a blob of light and there isn't much you can do about it. Now if I can make a reflector the size of an automobile, I can, th then I can get control, but of course that doesn't work. But this is the issue with optical control. With an area source, you have very little optical control. You can get some, of course. It's not a you know on-off sort of thing. Uh, but with a point source, you can get incredible optical control. And that's why point sources are so useful in situations where you need a highly articulated photometric distribution like area lighting and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, in a lot of applications, a blob of light is just right. And that's kind of part of the message. If, if what you need is a blob of light, don't go to a situation where you've got unbelievable optical control and the unforgiving aspects that come with that necessarily. If you've got both options, you'd rather be with an area source in that case. So all of the traditional light sources are too bright for direct view. And that includes LEDs. What do we do about it? We mitigate it. 
We use louvers, lenses, filters, shades, so on, to mitigate that brightness. Well, OLED doesn't really require that. Because it is the size that it is, and the luminance is spread over that surface, uh, Peter refers, it, refers to it as a human light source. There is something very attractive about that. It's very approachable. It's not harsh like the, the sources in, in days gone by. And our OLED design team here speaks in terms of simple, pure, and honest for OLED, meaning that it's not trying to uh, misrepresent itself. Here it is. We don't need to hide it. We don't need to apologize for it. In fact, we can celebrate it. This is one design that was done early on. It's contemporary, you know, a, a little bit retro in look, but, but the thing is, it, it lets us know that this, this high-tech <laughs> solution can still be very comforting. Another example that demonstrates this, this notion of sure, pure, simple, and honest. In this case, the light source itself <coughs> becomes the luminaire. Now, I mentioned earlier I was going to say a little something about application specificity. We have coined the term tailored lighting to describe this. And basically, this notion of tailored lighting, we're, we're talking about it all throughout the company. We're focusing on it throughout the company. Uh, it it kind of goes back to this notion of, of you know, delivering a product that's quite specific to the, to the uh, application in question. So it's the right light. It's about the right type of light in the right amount, in the right places, and at the right times. Time really being the controls component, primarily. The place is the interesting one, though. Consider your typical industrial facility. We're usually lighting those to 30-foot candles. But wait a minute, how much of that area, if you were to look at the floor area, how much of it is circulation? 50%? And for circulation, you need what, 10-foot candles? So if I could be very specific about my placement of light, I could save 2 thirds times 50%. That's one third of the light in the entire facility. That's huge. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about. And that's why I chose in the industrial application to exemplify this. So maybe in the future, instead of doing uniform layouts on 20 foot by 20 foot spacing and just kind of blasting light everywhere. Maybe we're going to do it a little more specifically in the future. I mentioned form factors. And so here, here, here's some examples. You know, thinness is, is uh, you know, an element that comes across. Also, in the case of LEDs, the, one of the things that's really interesting is whereas in the past we were dealing with a single high power source, or there might be two or three in the case of a fluorescent uh, fixture, and that was kind of about it. And so you had this single source, you're trying to produce light all throughout the space. Well, suddenly that's being replaced by in LEDs. I don't know how many, it depends on which LEDs you choose and so on. But the interesting thing about that is I can take some of those and use them for one purpose, some for another purpose, right? So I can go places, I can distribute them, I can do things that I really couldn't do before with single point source. Integration, I mentioned that. Here's some examples of integration. The one on the lower left there, if it's not clear, that's a handrail, a, a lighted handrail. And then here are some different OLED samples uh, to show us some of the different dimensions that are being worked on. Flexible OLEDs is one. Uh, transparent ones, ones that have decorative finishes, and then obviously colors. All of that is currently being researched. So we're talking about lighting that makes a human connection. And I have to admit, the first time I heard that, I was skeptical. Really? Human connection, lighting? But now I realize that, oh yes, and, and, and 
not in a small way either. Uh, so let me see if I can show you an example of that. I, I, I want to try to pull together all these pieces that I'm talking about, the systems, the integration, bring the controls piece into the picture. What would a, what would a lighting system that pulls all these pieces together to take us places we couldn't go yesterday, what, what might that look like? This is a concept that we rolled out at Light Fair this year that we call ERA. It's a wall recessed fixture, so there's your integration part. Put it into the wall. And it, uh, along the lower ledge on the inside where you can't see it are quite a number of high power white LEDs that are giving you a performance distribu photometric distribution out of there, equivalent to what you'd get out of a, a, a wall mounted floodlight, indoor floodlight, or, uh, or a surface, surface mount peerless type product. And it's a system in that you can get as many as you want and configure them however you want. It needs to be done as a system though because uh, each one of those then has a, uh, a sheet of engineered plastic in the inside and then behind that RGB on the top and on the bottom, two different RGB set points so that you get a color gradient and you can make it look just like the sky. And when I say just like the sky, um, one of the fellows that I graduated with came to our office and was staring at it for five minutes and all of a sudden his face just went, and he says, that's not the sky. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's also dynamic. Every unit can act independently of one another. So what we were demonstrating there in, in, in Philadelphia was that you can have clouds pass over, it changes over the course of the day, you can change the color temperature, you can change the intensity, you can choose I want a Maui sunrise, I want an Arizona sunset, I want to look at the Canadian Northern Lights, or today I'm in a purple mood, or whatever you want to do, right? There, there is a personalization aspect of it here, and you'll see it in this because it'll change to show you a few different possibilities in this one. Now both of these images that you've seen so far are Kevin's Photoshop. The, the, this, is, this is before we actually built it. The, this, is, this is the kind of thing that I typically will do. I'll work in Photoshop and we'll try to convince ourselves that we've got something that's worthy of pursuing. Th then we go forward from there. But that's an actual photo of the real thing uh, mocked up in our office in, in Wheat Ridge. And so uh, Anyway, that's something that's going to be commercialized within the year. Uh, well, actually, that one's interesting because you can see the cloud coming in on the left. I, I s snapped that shot right when it was starting. <coughs> but so that's supposed to be commercialized within the year. But hopefully you can see that this is really going in a, in a direction that we haven't r dealt with previously. And, and you, you, the, the photographs and, and images here, they, they can't do it justice. When you're immersed in that environment and you feel it out of your peripheral vision, it's really quite incredible. And I think what we're discovering too is that many of the attributes that we associate with uh, colored light, I think we're gonna find that it's not so much the photons being absorbed by our skin or our retinas that's, that's responsible in, in terms of a dosage, but just that that tiny little block up there on the wall, a few of those can do the trick. We don't need to immerse the whole environment in blue light in order to get those effects, I think. So with that, I want to close and say I think it's a really exciting time. I think the future is really bright. I hope this is a really positive message because I think it's a wonderful thing for all of us, I think the next few years are going to be really amazing. So that's it.
the fact that you work under uh, a cover. I think that air points out that we like we have the affinity of being able to perceive some the color or change or what, whatever the color effect is. But nobody's going to like to, to work under yellow or, exactly. yellow or, 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 or red light or, or green light. That's right, Peter. There's, there, there, you know, some applications like landscape uh, lighting, that sort of thing, um, oh, civil structures and so on. You can use really saturated light in those cases and it works wonderfully. But in terms of the places that we work and so on, I, I, you really don't want it. But I think that we are experimenting time and again because we, we are drawn to the possibility of using color without colorizing the whole space. We know that we want color, we want to play with it, but we've got to find ways to do that that are not going to color all the light. Yes, sir? Well, that's no different than daylight, because the sky is blue, but what, what we're actually seeing is white. The light that we're working under, you know, the sky in the background is blue, so you're kind of recreating. Very much, very much so, absolutely. And the intent is that, that that white portion that's illuminating the ceiling, it will be color tunable so you could, because you, you, you might want to change color temperature, but that's a very subtle change relative to the saturated colors. Meanwhile, we kind of like to tap into those colors because besides a martini bar or something, where else can you really use deeply saturated light? Mm -hmm. The other comment I had was <coughs> you were talking about industrial applications where you don't need the same light bubble. But I remember quite a few years ago, IES tried to come up with the idea that in an open office you had pass through areas that didn't need to be lit to the same level. So instead of having continuous rows, you could just light over each uh -huh. cubicle. So I mean, there, there's some other applications. Besides oh, absolutely. I think it's true in every application. I think we have to go around and analyze the lumens. And, and really be, you know, I, I, the, the whole horizontal illuminance thing, I mean, frankly, just needs to go by the wayside for the most part. It's, it, it, it's a tired old way of doing it. It's not, it's not very well cor correlated with the things that we value in lighting. For instance, uh, I went uh, in New York to see an a, a installation at um, Central Park, and you know, the, the specification is so many foot candles horizontal. Well, they had a place where it was done very literally, and then they had a place that was done more, the, more conventionally. Well, if you literally light that path and knock the things off the path, that is a very uncomfortable situation. Turns out we like being able to see that people are jumping out of the bushes and that sort of thing. <laughs> so I think in every application we have, to, we have to really get in there, analyze exactly what is it that we value here, understand that better, and then develop the products that are going to do that quite explicitly and very energy, energy efficiently. We're going to try. I, I, Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I think the, the, the newest IES guy has uh, the design guy that they have something more than horizontal illumination now. They, they also ask the importance of vertical illumination. Mm -hmm. So I think we are, we, are, we are going towards what you just said. Uh, yeah, but it's uh, well, I have a theory about that, Peter, because the, uh, they've been trying ever since I've been around. But this time they actually put it down as something that with numbers and all that, yeah. They don't, uh -huh. I don't think they have numbers. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, you know, my experience is, okay, everybody kind of rattles through, where's the, where's the foot candles? Yeah. Uh, you know, where's, okay, get all that stuff, where's the foot candles? Right. And in there was, be careful to check this and this right. and this and this and this, and all that goes by the wayside, essentially, and bam, to the, to the specification. And... I became frustrated about that early on, and of course, as you know, with the development of visual, we were looking to develop a tool that would make this kind of analysis much easier. I'm convinced that one reason that it doesn't stick is because not that many people are accustomed to working in 3D, and if you're going to analyze vertical levels, you're going to have to build in 3D. I think that 
because that situation is what it is, the onus is on our shoulders to find an easier way to do this. <coughs> we want to get there. Maybe that isn't the best way to do it, to expect them all to be CAD experts. There's probably, there's probably a way to get at the same thing, and that's what I want to try to put, tease out. Uh, that, that's my objective, Peter. So it, it's, you know, it's a big one. Uh, there's a reason we wave our hands about those things, because it's complex. I mean, it's one, it's one thing to talk about veiling reflections, but an, quite another to really, really understand that in a particular application, right, for instance. But I think, I think verticals are by far the big issue. But we, we had some recent success with uh, Whole Foods. We had a new, a new product that produces uh, a very deliberate uh, distribution on the vertical and not on the floor, quite intentionally not on the floor. And Whole Foods in, installed it. We saw some pictures recently. Wow, what a big difference. That the product is really popping in that application. And my understanding is they're thrilled and we're doing more stores. And so that's on a growth pattern. So there's one example of situation where we took a product to a customer. And even though it seemed a little out of sorts, folks are uncomfortable not having illumination on the floor. Of course, you and I both know, Peter, that the unreflected enough is, is more than enough to see that you're not going to trip on the floor, especially not when you got 50-foot candles on a product right there. Uh, but it's, it's, it's just a change of mindset. And in that case, I think it's simple because we just have the aisles. Other applications get a little more complex. But we'll, we'll find those solutions. And, and I think, in general, the attitude that we've got, we're not going to worry about things like dark skies compliance and so on and so forth. If we feel that this particular approach is the right approach, we're going to go ahead and go there and then teach the world, as opposed to letting that sort of thing steer us. Go ahead. Um, in one of your early slides, you mentioned something about um, glitter. Or not glitter. About sparkle. About sparkle, yes. And, um, in my very base knowledge of lighting design that I learned early on in my career <clears throat> as a designer, lighting was always a harmony between the lumen output, the color rendering, and also the color, the temperature, the variations in temperature. And the most exciting light that I have seen in, within a reasonable grasp has been the halogen light. And I haven't yet found that in the LED lighting. Mm. And I don't have very much experience or knowledge of the OLED other than coming to these lectures. But with the knowledge that you have and the product and the science that you have, do you see that, that glitter or that sparkle in light being within reach? Absolutely. And Absolutely. Within, within how much time do you see that being, um, I guess, accessible to the general public? Well, the the. The sparkle piece is really about the size of the light source, mm -hmm. so, you, so it, it, it'll need to be a point source. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as far as the color attributes and, all, and, and those other elements, uh, the total lumen output and so on. I, for instance, I was looking at an MR16 replacement the other day, and uh, it, it's only 200 lumens. It's not a replacement, it's, right. you know, and, but they're coming. Mm -hmm. They're coming. And I think that all of those attributes, the, the, the thing is, that particular source is so coveted that um, you can bet that as quickly as the technology will allow, you will have a replacement for that. It's, it, 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 I love them too. I, yeah, yeah they, they just work wonderfully. Go ahead. I have a question, Kevin. Are you following? Who's doing research on the psychological or physiological effects of, of things like either perceived color or um, color temperature cycles in like really extreme environments like the space station or the Arctic, places like that, mm. or the Antarctic, where we've got scientists who probably don't see the sun for six months a year? There is work like that being done. I'm not 
you know, I, I'm not up to speed on it though, Alex. Uh, but I, I'm aware of several studies that have been done for situations like that, that look at the circadian rhythms and so on. How and, and you know, I know they've they've taken people and buried them in the ground for months, and then just watch what happens to their circadian cycle and and. If I remember correctly, it was like a, about an hour. It was about an hour off, like, like as a 23-hour. Well, that's like the, the JPL team when they're working on the the latest uh, lander in the science station. They had to work on Martian time, so they were essentially sequestered <laughs> on campus, so they could sleep there and work on Martian time because that would drift. It was like a something like a 23-hour day or 26-hour day. So each day they're drifting, right? So three uh -huh. weeks later they're back where they started. <laughs> they had to have that control. But I think it's just more of an interesting thing. Obviously, the food industry has picked up on this with effects for control of livestock and growth and things like that. But as far as we consider health of, of humans and valued people who are working in very extreme environments, whether it's remote mining operations or remote science outposts, you know, it's an interesting area. Absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 I know that there are folks working on it. Uh, I see information, little bits here and there that, that come out. It's usually, honestly, a little too specialized for me to, to you know, to really hit my radar. Uh, but it is very interesting, and it's going to be even more so as as light becomes a drug. The implications. Think of the legal implications alone. We're just not real sure what that means. I, I seem to recall, like six or seven years ago, there was even a guest speaker at McClug at the <coughs> school uh, from Germany. I don't remember his name. They were talking about using color, different colored lights in the healthcare mm -hmm. industry. Oh, oh uh, it was Michael Rohe. what's that? It was Michael Rohe that I had seen. Uh -huh. and, and, it, and it just seems like, I don't know where that went. I mean, it was like, it was the, 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 Osram actually is, is or, you know, in Europe in particular, I think they're kind of uh, leading in that area, them and Phillips. Um, and <coughs> recommendations are coming out. Those studies are still underway. Uh, you probably heard of that Phillips study with the uh, school luminaire, or did you? They came out with a school fixture that had uh, several different settings that, that, that determined the intensity and the color temperature. So for instance, uh, when it was test time, it would go to a really high level, very cool color temperature to focus. When they came back from recess, there was another setting that was warm and, and subtle to, to calm them down. And they found that the, the, the pupils uh, retained the information better, learned more readily, were better uh, behaved in the classroom, and, and so on. But by significant margins, almost unbelievable uh, <laughs> differences. Uh, that's now being repeated and uh, the early data I'm told looks looks like they're going to validate that. So uh, and, and that's Osram doing it you know the, the repeat experiment. And they, Osram has also done a lot of stuff with uh, Alzheimer's patients in healthcare uh, and I the last time I'm trying to remember exactly how it went but the, there's, a, there's a difference in light coming from overhead versus, versus underneath. And so you have, to, uh, you have to attenuate that, but I can't remember, I'd have to go and, and re refresh my memory on it. Uh, but they're making recommendations both in terms of the color temperature and whether it's peripheral or overhead. Um, never be from underneath, I guess. but. Um, but I'd have to go and look at it again. Again, I, I, I look at that, you know, and I know that it's going on, but sort of my stance on the thing um, is, is really I want to wait until I have some firm recommendations. It's just a little scary, to be honest. And I think it's hard testing because most of the testing is done in the lab, and when you put it out in the environment, there are so many other issues in the environment. So right. how do you really say, that this is causing that. Mm -hmm. So that becomes the, the difficult part of saying, yes, do this. 
And then you, you, you know, you, you think about the blue light, well, you, you look at the dose that it takes to um, impact your circadian rhythms, it's the kind of thing we get by sitting at home looking at our laptop or TV. So, you know, you can only have so much control over it when people are going to do whatever they do. I'm so wrapped up in your questions and answers, I kind of forgot what I was going to say to y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if there's no more questions, thank you for coming. And um, to let y'all know, the next Martinis and Lights will be August 8th. You will have Sandra Stoshik here talking about daylighting. So if you want to learn more about daylighting, she will be here to talk about that. And then if you need AIA credit for today, I do have certificates. Come find me before you leave so I can give that to you. And as a little giveaway for y'all coming out today, I have martini shakers in the back for you to have. So help yourself and enjoy the rest of the night here. Thank, Thank you. you very much.